How's everyone doing this morning? All right, lots of excitement. <laughs> it's really hard to get excited without coffee, so hopefully everybody's got a chance to, to get some coffee and warmed up. I see a lot of people with coffee. That's a, that's a good sign. Um, so what I'm going to cover today is I'm going to talk about open source security, and I'm going to cover a, a range of different topics. Um, so, just for my background, I'm the VP of Developer Relations at JFrog. Also, I sit on the um, Open Source Security um, Governing Board, so I'm involved in a lot of the OpenSSF initiatives, the new ONC, ONCD archive, which we're putting in for the recent government um, issue. And um, I think that um, the reason why we're all here is because now security has become the job of everybody. It's become the job of developers, of cloud native developers, of DevOps teams, of um, folks who, of course, are in security roles and security offices. Who, who here is a software developer, cloud native developer? Okay, quite a number of folks. Who here is in a security research role or, or security? Okay, so a few folks who are security researchers. And um, anybody from a DevOps team doing infrastructure? Okay, so we, we have a full, did, did I miss anybody? <laughs> okay. So I think we have a full gamut of, of different folks covered. And um, when when we're thinking about open source security, I think a good way or a good analogy of thinking about security is comparing it to food and the food supply chain. So um, you know when you're when you're cooking, you, you want to start with fresh ingredients. You want to make sure that you're getting the the very best, freshest um, stuff for your for your restaurant. But what happens when you start with some spoiled ingredients, or you don't have good ingredients? So this is this is a photo from um, Kitchen Disasters. Um, any, anybody a fan of watching Chef Ramsay rip rip apart restaurants? Yeah. So we, we love we love watching the disasters, which unfold before us. It never it helps us forget how horrible our online and jobs are at times. And these are probably not the free range chickens that you're looking for. No. So that we want to avoid. Disasters like this in our software supply chain, where we're creating software which is as free from vulnerabilities, we're addressing the vulnerabilities quickly, and um, I, I think what you need is you need a healthy food supply chain or a healthy security supply chain to accomplish this. So, um, you know, this this is the the ideal picture from the um, the U.S. Um, whatever you uh, FDA. USDA, USDA, yeah, yeah. So that, that this is their ideal supply chain where everything just happens magically. The, the, you get good fresh produce from the farm, and then it goes through distribution of processing plants, which are clean, and it goes to restaurants, which are nothing like the Chef Ramsay restaurants. And um, you, you end up with a, a very clean supply chain. And in the open source world, the, the equivalent of this would be. Um, if we were following good practices like Salsa, which is supply chain level for software artifacts, um, this is one of the OpenSSF projects. It's, it's a great way to make sure that you're looking at all the different possible entry points for um, vulnerabilities, for malicious packages, for um, different things to enter your supply chain inadvertently. And it goes through a whole bunch of the different steps where you may have vulnerabilities in your application. So um, I think most of us by now know that you have to be careful about um, you know, source code and source code reviews and making sure that you're doing all the things right with your own source code. Hopefully you know that there's a lot of different vectors for getting malicious packages into your supply chain. So it could be coming from, um, from NPM or from PyPy or other central repositories. Um, but even then, you could get compromised with your CI/CD system. You could have something which gets injected right before you sign your build. Um, so there's a whole bunch of different dependencies and, and threats and places where it can enter the supply chain. And when you're not following these best practices, what you end up is with disasters like. Now this is a this is an old one, but a, a good one. So the um, the Equifax data breach. Um, it was a result of one of the um, um, Java security exploits um, that affected um, Apache, and it cost 1.4 billion in cleanup costs and 1.38 billion in consumer claims. So this is a huge risk for, for companies. 
um, and ended up affecting 143 million U.S. consumers. So, like a huge wide reach. Um, they patched their main system, so they knew about the vulnerability, and they patched their main system. But it got through another system that was inside their firewall that was used for um, um, different purposes. That and they got entry, and they got exploited privileges. They moved around the network. They started exfiltrating the data. And um, it wasn't until a few months later where they realized there was a data breach. Um, they closed down the vault, but they already lost a bunch of data. Um, and this was eventually attributed to um, like some <coughs> Russian nation state hackers. <laughs> but here's looking. Um, so theoretically, they've actually done nothing with the data, but it does cause a lot of a lot of viral damage. Um, Lock for shell. How many folks had to patch a, a system? Um, Okay, so this was this was a huge widespread exploit. Everybody uses um, logging if you're using any job applications. This affects you. Um, it, it was interesting in that you, if you were just using Log4j4, you actually weren't affected. It was only if you're using the full Log4j stack, and you, you could even disable it with a configuration by turning off the JNDI feature, which flags this. But um, everybody. Just to be safe, upgrade their version of Log4j in pretty much all production systems. Um, 70,000 open source projects use Log4j as a dependency, 170,000 use it as a transit dependency. So, pretty much the entire supply chain was affected by this one exploit, and it causes a lot of, a lot of damage. And um, this one, I, again, an old one, but a good one. So, um, in the case of SolarWinds, this kicked off a lot of the legislation, a lot of the concern around um, open source security. Um, this was a, a case where they actually got into the, the network of SolarWinds, um, got into their CICD servers, um, did modify the code right before signing. So they've gone through the source code was successful. They went through the build phases, and then they injected stuff right before it was signed. So the end deliverable looked like it was signed by SolarWinds, um, but actually it was a malicious package, and 18,000 customers were affected, a lot of government customers. It opened up a big backdoor entry point for everyone who got affected by this breach, which could be um, could cause further damage to all their customers. So quite a quite a bad exploit. Um, so on average, the cost of the data breach in 2023 was 4.45 million. Okay, so quick show of hands. So today, how many folks are aware of a um, security incident response? Um, plan in your company when a breach happens. Okay, so that was a lot of hands. Now, five years ago, did that exist? Okay, so you had one five years ago. <laughs> but I think that like this amount of damage, like this amount of um, cost, which is being introduced in our industry, is fairly new. And um, for all the developers in the audience, now it's become our job and our responsibility to write code that's secure. All right, so put your, put your hand on your chest as a developer. <laughs> <laughs> it's my responsibility. I think, of course, even when you write secure code, there are other incidents and vulnerabilities and things which get into the pipeline. But I think we're all trying as hard as possible to write code. Um, so my, my daughter's also in the audience, and um, so I get to watch. This is very good. <laughs> Uh, I used to watch some of her computer science classes. She was a student at Colorado State University. And unlike when I was a developer, um, where they taught us programming, they taught us like you know functional languages, all this cool stuff first, she's taking a basic, you know, level like 101 computer science class, and they're teaching them um, memory safety, avoiding buffer overruns, like using the later C standards so you're you're not exposing your so that's that's exciting that universities are actually identifying that this is a real job skill. This is something which um, they need to start teaching at school. So um, which which of these is your package? <laughs> so like, did you know you found it? <laughs> oh, nice. Okay, yeah. You, so you can pick that one up. So I, I think that you know it's very there, there are a lot of innovative attacks. Um, this is a, a clever one as well. If you haven't heard of it, the dependency confusion attack. And um, hackers are very, very good at finding different ways of entering the supply chain. So this one is a dependency confusion attack. Basically, you're getting the wrong package. You're getting not the package that you expected to get. 
Um, this, this is an example of a uh, intercepted request to NPM, which shows you that um, all of the requests actually have the, the full namespacing of the packages you're requesting. Um, I, think, I think they fixed this, but originally it was also clear text, so you could actually do that in the middle of text easily and pull this out. And um, once you get the package name, let's say, let's say somebody's asking for a package that doesn't exist. So, you know, I work at Yelp, I'm, I'm doing code, and I'm asking for a bunch of internal packages. What they can do next is they can um, publish a package with that name into NPM. NPM's pretty liberal on whatever you want to publish, Python's the same. And then um, if you have a vulnerable package manager, when you request this, instead of getting version 1.2, which is what you want if you say latest, it's going to pull the magical 666 version down from the central repository, and then bad things happen um, when you let kitties push red buttons. And um, then you're going to be pulling the, the artifact, which you don't want. Now, most package managers, um, Artifactory does it, Nexus does this as well. So most modern package managers will actually insulate you from this sort of attack, where they'll make sure that if it exists in internal repositories, it will go out and fetch it from external repositories. This is one way you can protect your developers from doing this. But um, our buddy, Alex Persson, um, made a lot of money on this. So he, he was very clever in how he did the bug bounty. So he, he found the exploit. This was kind of a theoretical exploit for a while, but nobody had actually like, like proven it, done the exfiltration, and actually showed how you could actually attack corporate systems using this. So he, he did the full attack, did it against um, Apple, Google, made a whole bunch of companies all at once. He went for all of the bug bounty programs, and then he collected about 20,000 from each of the corporations, and together got 130,000. So, um, if, you're, if you're tired of you know, your day job and you're like, I want a good side gig where I can do fun stuff, then you know, maybe you can become a hacker and you know, do bug bounties for a living. Okay, and um, here's another fun one. So, um, so you know, if they're calling for rice and a recipe, what type of rice do you want? There's a lot of types of rice. So if you're, if you're cooking, you know, let's say, a, what's a good rice dish? Like a, Spanish one with a uh, paella. Paella, 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 yeah, yeah. So if you're doing a good paella, and you use, let's say, you use like a black rice, would that work? No, no. It's gonna, it's gonna come out horrible. It's gonna be the, the wrong um, result. And this is similar to another sort of attack. This is a common attack. Um, this one, we caught some our security research team caught malicious hackers putting in packages for Azure um, libraries, but they left off the um, prefix. So they publish exactly the same package with the prefix. It's also common to do um, typo squatting, where you, you put in typo, typo errors, you just make random typo errors, publish a bunch of packages. Um, they were also clever that they, they did it by forging a bunch of accounts. So each of the packages they published was from the same account, it sort of all showed the different accounts, so it's kind of a very clever way of doing it. And they did this for 218 packages in Azure, Azure Text, Azure Tools, Catalang. And basically the goal here was if you're a lazy developer and you don't actually put in a package and you, you get one of these by accident, um, when it installs it into NPM, it runs a package install script and that's going to immediately trigger the malicious code. Um, now this, this attack was later attributed to a group that said they were doing research. So it was a security research, kind of like a white hat. Um, we reported it to um, NPM, they pulled down all the artifacts before we published the results. Um, but again, it's something else to watch out for. So, but what we want to do is we want to start with fresh ingredients, not, not rotten ingredients like this in our software supply chain. And um, when you're looking at this and managing your open source supply chain, um, I listen to bananas, so I have changed that to a banana there. Um, well, Melissa is one of my coworkers, and she's speaking later today as well. So come to your talk with me. Um, so you have all this modern infrastructure, and you have this poor little package which has been maintained like years ago. And um, this is a good example of the last pad incidents. So developer and key organization couldn't come up with agreement on the NPM package. NPM sided with key organizations, so they gave them the namespace. Um, the developer unpublished his package. 
and 272 other packages, one of which was lack of bad, and um, then that somebody else stepped in and published a functionally identical package later to fix this. But this was a case where the whole supply chain fell apart because there was a maintainer, a, you know, for unpaid, I did this in my spare time, and what is what is left there? This is the whole function which blew everything up. So it's a very, very small amount of code relates to these developers. We don't want to write this, we'll include this dependency, and that collapsed the whole software supply chain. So that's an example of what can happen. And um, this is my, my favorite quote from Dan Lorenz, who is creator of of six or I think work the chain guard now. Every time you pick this call, go get or maybe fetch something, you're doing the equivalent of plugging a thumb drive you found on the sidewalk into your production server. So let's not let's not do this. All right. So um, who do you trust? Who who uses one of these registries? PyPy, NPM. All right. So pretty much everybody in the in the audience raised their hands. And do you trust these registries? No. No. No, well, not anymore, maybe. You have to. You have to pull from them. So um, this is the number of exposed secrets that our research team found in all of these repositories. We, we ran tooling to look for exposed secrets. Um, in Docker Hub, of course, Docker files are huge bits of, of stuff that nobody understands. So that was 5.78 million. Next highest was in PM with 1.16 million. And um, this is a big problem. Now, let me let me give some tips on how you can avoid exposing your own secrets. Okay, so first, number one is not using automation to check for, oh, if you're not using automation to check for um, exposed secrets, then you could potentially be using exposed secrets. Um, so we do this with our product. Truffle Hog is a good open source tool to use on your project. So if you're not using Truffle Hog or, um, or some commercial solution for this, Highly recommended, and then this way you're at least have a, like a layer of insulation in your build, where it'll throw a build check or flag, or you can edit into your um, your your git commit books to make sure nobody accidentally checks in. You know their their exposed secret. We actually recently found an example of um, corporate secrets which somebody inadvertently sent to an open source repo, and then gave access to their internal Slack and their internal GitHub repo. So it's it's very scary what people. Do just do accidentally in um, coding. Mistake number two is generating tokens with broad permissions that never expire. So when you're doing token generation, always do it for a finite amount of time with the limit, most limited amount of permissions you can. This avoids if somebody does get access to the token, they have a very short period of time to use it, and they can't get escalated privileges or do additional damage. Um, mistake three, no access moderation for the secret. So um, you want to hopefully be using something like um, Kubernetes secrets, Docker secrets, um, or HashiCorp Vault for making sure that you're managing your secrets and making sure that um, you're not exposing things unnecessarily. Mistake four: fixing a leak by unpublishing the token. Yeah. So this is the this is not a fix when you accidentally commit something with a token because Git has a very very long memory. And um, you can never ever get rid of that token which you've now committed to the public repository. So you actually have to um, make sure the token is expired, like like revoke the token, make sure that nobody can use that token which got published, and then publish, you know, say, uh, don't publish the new token that you generate. Um, and then your systems won't be exploitable. And mistake five, exposing unnecessary assets publicly. So something which happens a lot is people kind of post and they do things where they're, they're posting internal test libraries, internal projects, which have a lot more data, information, and things which are kind of accessed to internal servers. So make sure that you're not accidentally publishing your test repositories, your debug repositories, and other stuff in production. And we saw a bunch of cases for this. Okay, and then to, to use open source safely, we need good standards as well. And, um, I think OpenSSF scorecards is a great example of, of like how you can use an automated tool to help make sure you're up to the latest standards. This is a, a new OpenSSF project. It is also, we have some automated command line tooling, um, GitHub, GitHub tooling as well, so you can hook it up with your GitHub. And we just announced um, a couple weeks ago, we also support for GitLab. So if you're using GitLab, you can also tie in scorecards with that. It'll run a whole bunch of checks. Um, it'll check for um, 
CVs, which you might be exposed to in libraries, upstream libraries. It'll do maintainer checks to make sure you have the right maintainer um, code reviews and things happening. And it does all this in an automated fashion to get, make sure you have good hygiene either on your own projects or on upstream projects which you're consuming. So I think this is really important and something um, exciting. Now, um, the next section, I'm going I'm to go a little bit quickly on this because I want to get leave some time for questions. But um, everyone, does everyone know what a CV is? Okay, so pretty much everyone knows what a CV is. Now, what you might not know about CVs is that CVs actually, a lot of CVs, the way they get stored and the way this is done can leave you vulnerable. Uh, and when I say when it leave you vulnerable, if you look at the naive approach for how CVs are evaluated, um, basically what they do is they're, they're looking at the exploit, like how commonly this library is used in, in industry, um, like what level of security exposure that it gives you. And the um, CV rating is often heavily overrated or underrated based upon your, your industry. Um, so for most of us building you know, enterprise applications, cloud native applications, there are certain um, factors about the configuration we run under, the environments we run under, how we, how we do things. And um, CVs, for example, in GUI command line tools, while they may exist, you're unlikely to be running GUI command line tools from an enterprise application where while it's running an exploit could be injected. So there's, there's a whole bunch of these CVs which, which get very high ratings where it doesn't really make sense. Um, the other thing about CVs is often there's very specific information about like how it has to be run, what the prerequisites are. So it has to have a certain configuration, it has to have um, Possibly you can call a certain method in it or something, and again, you'll you'll get high severity warnings. So if you run a typical source code scanning tool, you'll end up with a bunch of CVs which have high severity warning, um, simply because in your in, it doesn't apply to your environment, but it's a very high critical exploit. So um, this is an example of a critical vulnerability, right? So it's um, CV twenty twenty two twenty six two six six one two. It's a to do vulnerability in the untar function um, using get canonical path. And the environment prerequisite for this is you're running in Windows. So who runs a production workload in Windows? Okay. So you, you're a very brave man. <laughs> very sad man. <laughs> and you, you, this, this CV does matter for you. Because Okay, yeah, but like this is a lot of the analysis of CVs happen because of these sort of um, is it applicable to your environment? Um, so, something we do at JFrog is we have a contextual analysis capability which automatically looks for have you mitigated the code, is the configuration set up, um, and there's other tools to do this as well. But, like, like, I think one thing to do is when you're looking at CVs, don't just look at the severity, look at how applicable it is for your specific environment. And the other issue with CVs is often it's very, very high. The securities are high. CVSS 4.0 solves a lot of this with the changes to how they're doing scoring in the new version of it. Um, and we also, in our products, have our own security, security score for enterprise customers. OK, so key takeaways. Don't take the CVSS at face value. Consult different sources for your CVSS data. So um, look at, you know, often the project maintainer will dispute the CV score on, on issues. Like there was a curl exploit, uh, it was like a 9.8 or some very high severity. Um, but it turns out that it wasn't a legitimate vulnerability. The folks that maintained the project showed that it couldn't be exploited in practice, even though they've been since for a lot of curl versions. And they ended up revoking a CV three days later. But a lot of teams jumped on it because of the criticality and because every, everybody uses the system which has curl. Okay, so last thing, can we trust the machines with our ingredients? So would it be a complete presentation this year without an ML AI, ML AI um, reference? And um, does anyone want to guess what the answer is? No. No, no, we can't. Okay, so machine learning models are already being maliciously targeted. So um, this is one exploit which we've seen um, hackers doing. So the H5 format for models. Um, allows you to put code inside of there, 
which gets injected when the model gets loaded on a developer's computer. And um, basically it gives you arbitrary code execution. Um, you can use it for ransomware or for other purposes. And um, this is uh, an attack which is fairly new because it's, it's on an entirely new um, technology, which a lot of us probably don't even assume is subject to a lot of malicious attacks. Uh, uh, okay, so what else can we do? So, I think the most important thing we can do is educate ourselves. So thank you all for coming to my session and you know, learning a little bit more about security, about what OpenSSF is doing to help secure the supply chain. Hopefully I gave you some examples you can apply to your workspace and place as well to improve your security posture. Um, here are some great resources. So the OWASP cheat sheets are great resources for you to look at and to learn more about how you can get developers trained on security. There's some great OpenSSF courses as well, um, which are great resources to, to teach um, developers about security and make sure that you, know, you have better security posture as an organization. And um, also our research team at JPRO has a lot of good um, information and exploits which we're working on. So this is just the blog only for our security research team, so it's all technical about things which they're researching and putting out. So, thank you very much, and hopefully together we can create a healthy software supply chain. Thank you so much. Do you have any questions? Hi, uh, great talk. Um, I have, you, you mentioned about OpenSF uh, scorecard, right? The major problems I had with that is when I when I uh, have a project on GitHub itself, and then when I register it to, you know, actually check for uh, the scorecard, I uh, I go through all their automation. But then, if I don't want that, uh, I, if I'm developing some software and if I want to run uh, OpenSF on that software, and when I download uh, scorecard locally, and then when I run it on my software, it doesn't do all the checks. Like it does, does almost less than half the checks. So it's not kind of I, I did not find it. Very reliable for my software, which is like downloaded or not on GitHub. Or if I I see, I yeah. So, like if the project, the open source project on GitHub, it runs all the checks and it works. But then on the like the local on your maybe kind of your commercial projects for work, exactly. it's less useful in terms of the range of checks yeah. you run. So I think I think that's that's great feedback. So um, like everything else in OpenSSF, Scorecards is a community run project. So um, right now, actually, we just talked about this um, last week, that we, we need more folks to contribute to scorecards to improve it. Um, so the, the code base is written in Go. If you're a Go developer and you're interested to help out, um, I think it'd be great to get contributions here. Also, there's a mailing list and regular meetings that you can attend to participate in scorecards. So, I mean, I'll be happy to give the feedback on scorecards to the team working on it, but also, like, as a community member, you can you can just join, participate, and help to make it better for us. So, thank you. And it's great to hear that you're, you're using scorecards on some of your projects as well. That's exciting. I have a question about the supply chain work for all this. In the physical world, supply chains are usually accompanied by contracts and commitments and money changing hands, and in the open source supply chain world, none of that exists. And I wonder what it means to use that way of thinking when the things that we're depending on are provided with no warranty, are provided um, best use uh, maybe by people we don't know anything about. And I just, I just wonder, we're, we're, we seem to be pulling on a on a chain that starts with weak links. So I, I, I think this that's actually an astute observation on the state of, of open source supply chains is that it's not it's not like a commercial supply chain. Um, and not only is it it breaks the metaphor, but also it leads to things like there's currently some EU legislation which is attempting to put the um, onus on security to the owners of the repository or technology. So, um, so for example, um, I'm also involved in the, the Rust Foundation, and uh, they've been trying to push back and fight some of the EU legislation, which may make them responsible for crates.io and all the software distributed on that. And it, it, it really doesn't make sense in a software space 
that as an open source maintainer, if I release something, I'm wholly responsible. Of course, I should patch vulnerabilities and release new versions, or somebody should contribute a patch. But um, you, you can't be held liable for um, like, like vulnerabilities which appear in the future. So that's a, a good observation. One more? No, that's one. Okay. So it's great to have supply chain security for our own stuff, but when we start talking about dependency, it's kind of the same building on what he was asking about. How do we ensure that when we import dependencies from other places that we can say, not only that they attest that they follow good supply chain practices, but that somebody has actually demonstrated this? Because it's one thing for me to say, yeah, I followed all healthy supply chain practices, and it's quite another for me to actually do that. Um, so I, I think scorecards is one attempt to make it easy to check a bunch of the, the things which you want to do as a project to improve your, your security posture. Um, the salsa supply chain levels, they, that gives you kind of providence and it gives you the ability to make sure that all the dependencies are, are known and that there's attestations along the way. Um, now, I, I think that in practice, um, you really can't trust all of the upstream projects right now to, to be following good security practices. And the, the hackers know this and they, they're finding vulnerabilities in the supply chain. And um, so like, like at my company, we, we basically have a, a whole division, like 50 people who just spend their days looking for security holes, tracking the hacker groups and seeing what sort of exploits they're doing and then creating automated fixes for those for our customers. So, I mean, at some point it's an arms war. The hackers have a lot to gain, and they have found a lot of value in doing supply chain attacks against developers. Um, as open source projects, we have now better tooling for this, and then I think as companies, you have to make some investments in security if you want to make sure that you're keeping up with the attacker. All right, thank so, you. Sorry, no, thank no you. question. Time for more questions, but if you want to speak with Stephen, he will be around. So thanks so much. Great talk.